Somewhere in the world, someone is watching you. They are one step ahead of you, using you as a pawn in a chess game, constructing the events of your life like a screenplay as you exist in an oblivious utopia. If everything around you is manufactured, is anything at all real? This is not a commentary of the modern surveillance state, but an earth-shattering reality for Truman Burbank. Director Peter Weir's distinct stylistic choices, coupled with Andrew Nichols' ominous screenplay, worked together to create the immersive cinematic world of the 1998 film The Truman Show that is so effective it feels eerily familiar to our own. The visual structure of The Truman Show is one of the most captivating aspects of the film, cleverly utilizing different camera angles and movements alongside critically timed character blocking to create the well-oiled machine that is the town of Sea Haven. We first see our titular character as the show's viewership would, encased behind a television screen. It seems as if he's talking to us, until he breaks away and we realize there's a hidden camera in his bathroom mirror. Many of the shots of Truman throughout the film are framed in order to look like they are being captured by a hidden camera. This results in a number of unconventional shots. We often see Truman encircled by an iris, under the scope of a fish eye lens, or obstructed by other items. The camera is not placed in the most obvious or convenient location, but rather exists anywhere it will appear inconspicuous, like this shot of Truman's rear as he tends to his garden. The notion of capturing the clearest shot possible is abandoned in order to achieve the perception of reality. This hidden camera visual structure is broken for the first time by the inciting incident, the stage light falling from the sky, where Truman is shown for the first time from a wide exposed angle. Before when he looks into the camera, it feels as if we were having a conversation with him. This time, it imposes a feeling of voyeurism onto the audience, like we are looking at something we shouldn't be seeing. Yet we still watch, and when he escapes, we too cheer like the audience watching him from their homes, from a crowded bar, or from their bathtubs. And you can see when I've moved my feet enough to get in and around the character, and you can tell when I have zoomed out or stepped out a little bit and been I'm outside of the action. You can really feel it. So the more and more you're operating and you think you've locked onto that little shot, just take a couple more steps in to get a little bit more in the action. And that's what's gonna excite the frame a lot more. This is reality television cinematographer Sherry Cock speaking on the importance of capturing truth on screen. But unlike most unscripted television, The Truman Show does not employ cinematographers who cart around hefty film cameras, instead placing them covertly amongst the crowd. This makes the audience feel as if they are in on the action, like they themselves might be a resident of Sea Haven. The first occurrences of these cameras on the inside are relatively tame. The pair of men who repeatedly shove Truman in front of different advertisements, the dog who playfully jumps on him every morning, or the radio that converses with him on his way to work. However, as Truman begins to doubt more and more the fundamental truths of his life, these shots appear more chaotic. When Sylvia's quote-unquote father comes to retrieve her after she reveals to him the truth, the sequence is turbulent the shots of Truman appearing like they were taken from a police body camera. Later, when Truman confronts Merrill, they are both shown obstructed by irises, instead of it being specifically directed at Truman. This is the first time that either of them are confronting the manufactured nature of their relationship and seeing each other in different lights. Kristoff's presence in the film is nothing short of godlike, as the camera asserts. The first time the audience is granted a conversation with Kristoff, it is during an interview that is shown to us through screens. Unlike showing Truman through a screen, this is a way of giving Kristoff power. Truman is still on screen during the interview, but he is tiny and in the corner. He still exists, but we are reminded of who really calls the shots. The final confrontation between Kristoff and Truman is expertly framed. Kristoff gazes downward at Truman while Truman looks up at him, appearing small and powerless in contrast to Kristoff whose face takes up the entire screen. As Robert Gall writes in his 2019 journal, Kristoff can claim from his vantage point on high to know Truman better than Truman knows himself. It is fitting that the last time we see Truman, the camera is surrounded by a vignette as he gives his final bow. This is the last taste the audience gets of him before he disappears into the sky, concluding his unwitting performance. 
Andrew Nichols' screenplay shows how Truman has inadvertently made himself into a character in his own fabricated story. He speaks in catchphrases. Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. That'd be all for you, Truman? That's the whole kit and caboodle. Anything else, Truman? That's the whole ball of wax. He behaves in a cartoonish manner with exaggerated gestures and an overzealous grin. As he begins to spiral into disbelief, his catchphrases become nonsensical. Early bird gathers no moss, Rolling Stone catches the worm, right? <laughs> the plot of The Truman Show is in a sense biblical, from Kristoff pulling the strings like a puppet master to Truman's fear of water, the motif reappearing throughout the film. Water is Truman's barrier, but it's also his way of escape. It surrounds the entire town in a semicircle, trapping him. Water, quote unquote, killed his father, but the beach is where he goes when he wants to be alone. He takes Sylvia here on their first date. Marlin, his best friend, is even named after a fish. Truman cannot travel over water, his only exit from Sea Haven by car. It is when he conquers his fear of water that he is finally able to escape. Kristoff is the god of Truman's story. For a moment, Truman begins to feel like a god himself, as he stops traffic on the street, notices pedestrians on a loop throughout his neighborhood, and begins to realize that the world he lives in is created for him. For Truman, this is something that is negative, yet for Kristoff, it is the thing that gives him power. Without Truman, Kristoff is not a god at all, which is why he tries so desperately to keep him in Sea Haven that he almost kills him as a result. This dynamic clearly establishes them as protagonist and antagonist. In a film titled The Truman Show, we might expect Truman to have the first line, but instead it is given to Kristoff. This begs the question, who is the main character? Who is the show about if not the titular character? Is Truman really who he thinks he is, or is he merely who Kristoff created him to be? This is only exemplified by the ambiguous ending, where Truman ascends the stairs, disappearing into nothingness. This is not his story, and it never was. Truman's escape is the true beginning to his story, one that the audience does not get to witness anymore. In a world where we can never be sure if we are being watched or listened to, where some reality television shows are accessible on a 24-hour live stream, where advertisements are hidden in the most inconspicuous of places, this film exists as a cautionary tale of sorts. The real reason why The Truman Show is so impactful to modern audiences is that it does not hide behind the veil of a sci-fi futuristic world. It is grounded in reality. We very well may be one of the spectators sitting in a bar watching Truman's life unfold. Or perhaps we are Truman ourselves, waiting to reach the door that will free us from the reality in which we are presented.